Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Big Apple Hockey. And it is almost the most wonderful time of the year. This is like our Christmas, boys, where we're getting just NHL hockey ready to come at us. I, of course, am your host, Mark Williams. And I've already talked for two and a half hours today, and I can't wait to do some talking that I actually really feel like doing. But a man who was able to do the final buzzer the other night with guests from Ranger Central, Mr. John Fulkowski. Thank you to Matt in the chat here and Evan also in the chat here for jumping on on that one. And yeah, uh, welcome back to small apple hockey basketball. <laughs> that that's gonna be Mark's de- that's gonna be Mark's demotion right there if he keeps messing up. Well, you know, there was a really weird one today. And of course, a guy who doesn't mess up at all, our member from the fourth period, Mr. Anthony Larocco. Yeah, how do you uh I think uh the Detroit Red Wings were pretty ticked at the Flyers last night, but that that was that was really entertaining. That whole sequence there in the span of like two minutes. Uh pretty crazy how it was decided. Anthony, that's so that's so much of a good lead in because that's what we're starting with. Uh and Matt is saying also since Mark Mark says the Penguins have not made the playoffs, you were said, wait, wait, I said I said they weren't a playoff team. Get the tape. I said that was my hot take the entire time. So, guys, let's go to the A block. Oh, yeah, no, he, is, he is right. Mark is actually right. He yeah. Was the one who, who blasted them to hell right away and said that they were not a playoff team. Yeah, I said they weren't a playoff team, and I was getting worried that they were. I was also really considering that they were going to end up being a playoff team. But, guys, we're going to go right to the A block, and the A block is brought to you by SeatGeek. Use the promo code Big Apple Hockey for $20 off your first order. And of course, Big Apple Hockey Trucker Hats and Shirts are available. Click the link below. And we're going to be in a lot of post game shows. So make sure you look for the post game shows, whether it's the, fi- whoop, the final buzzer with John Falkowski or us the next day just going on. But let's recap what happened last night and the last couple of days, guys. And it, before we even get into the Rangers and Islanders, because Detroit, Monday night, staves off elimination in the final 90 seconds. Capitals and Penguins both position themselves to actually make one last push. And then Tuesday, Capitals and the Flyers are tied at one with five minutes remaining. Detroit trails Montreal in the closing minutes. Detroit ties the game with 3.3 seconds remaining as the Flyers and the Capitals still had four minutes remaining. But the Flyers needing the regulation win pulls the goalie to with about 3.30 remaining, TJ Oshie scores the game-winning empty netter. How many times do you guys ever say that? And then the Flyers were eliminated before all that happened because Detroit won. Mr. LaRocco, I'm going to start with you. What did you think about the the wild wild card race? I mean, it was it was wild. <laughs> Very descriptive. What's more wild? Him, that, or Giuseppe? Yeah, it was it was uh, it was a pretty crazy ending there. I mean, the, the Red Wings didn't never gave up. You got to give them credit for that. Um, you know, two nights in a row. First, Lucas Raymond, uh, and then David Perron with three point three seconds left. Um, and I, I was watching some of the the Red Wings media availability afterwards, and they said like, you know, it was really deflating because shortly after that they learned of their fate and how. Uh, Washington scored the empty net goal, but um, and Tortorella said too that he didn't know until afterwards, after he pulled the goalie, that Detroit had um, scored. So at that point, it didn't even matter. But just how it played out. Uh, but those teams, honestly, they only have themselves to blame for you know giving up valuable points, especially the Red Wings. I mean, they lost they lost two games to the Coyotes within a short period of time between each game. They lost both of them. Um, and for a team that has playoff aspirations, you, you, know, you can't do that. So uh, certainly, certainly very interesting how that all went down. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I guess you could say that, you know, the, the better teams got in, although I'm still surprised Washington got in. I mean, they, they're, they're such an anemic offensive team. I never, I never thought they would get into the playoffs, but thus here we are. They're in. Um, I think most people wanted to see the Red Wings in because just because they're a little more of a high octane, exciting team with young talent. But 
needless to say, it ended the way it did, but it was certainly must-see TV and very entertaining. Phil, what did you think about that ending? Because that was crazy, starting with – um, I mean, gotta, you got to look at that Detroit game. That's insane. That Complete madness, just utter chaos. Um, I, I saw an argument today that – some, one of my mutuals on Twitter posted that, uh, you know, after that, there should be no argument against having a, a play-in round. Why would I need a play-in round when we just had that? <laughs> that is the argument right there. Why would I need a play-in round when I had that madness on a Tuesday night? I have not had a Tuesday night that exciting in a very long time. So, yeah, that was great. Um, and if I was at a hockey bar where all the, the, the entire bar is just playing hockey somewhere in the middle of Canada or something like that, I'd probably be going nuts, pounding down Labatt's and Molson's <laughs> and, and, and that would have been a hell of a Tuesday night. That would even be a better Tuesday night, but, um, I was great. I was great. And it was, it was funny because when Detroit, Detroit must've found out in real time that the the flyers pulled the goalie and got scored on and oh she scored the empty netter because you could see what like when they went to overtime their body language was just meh gone and in, in the shootout when Kane went up you could see he had that look on his face like oh god like why what am I even doing anymore so and yeah Pete Labat blew for the win there buddy I totally agree on that ha- I had those at the Islander games when I went with uh, a friend of mine but that was fun. Ton of fun. Need to do it again. I would love to see something crazy like that next year, just as long as it doesn't involve the Rangers. And the Rangers are right back up where they are right now. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy enough on Saturday that that game that went back and forth uh, with the Rangers and the Islanders and just how stressful that is. I would prefer just not to even be anywhere near that. But um, you looked at that game and – uh, guys, that's proof yet again. NHL doesn't need to play in tournament. They play in tournaments the regular season because when you get these those teams that are jockeying for position, yeah, sure, the West was already settled probably about two weeks ago. But, I mean, this is what the goal is for and not to add on 9 million games. I understand we'd love to have it like it was 2010, Rangers versus Flyers, going to a shootout, and hopefully that does it. But you can't do – look, because here's the thing. Once you open up Pandora's box – it's you're going to get everybody saying stupid things like, oh, well, you know what they should really do with three game series. Oh, shut the hell up. You had 82 games to get in the 16. I, you know what? I think I think it's a matter of time before they have a play in round or at the very least they expand the field altogether. Because, you know, with the talk of maybe, you know, expanding to markets like Houston and Atlanta and going to 34 teams, maybe in the next and Arizona. couple of years, I, I think I think it's bound to happen. But um, for now. We just just cherish what we actually, got right now, but it's, it's, I think it's going to happen. Exactly. Yeah, because you know what? If you're gonna if you're gonna go to seventeen per conference, you're gonna add another on each side. You're gonna go Atlanta and then you know Houston on top of the Arizona relocation. It's gonna give you seventeen, and maybe they add uh, a, a like a plan for that last spot so that that way it kind of evens out the playing field in terms of how many make it, I guess. I, 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 that, that's what I could see happening. So, Because I, I do think Anthony brings up a good point there. Look, I think you're a good point with the numbers on it, Anthony, especially when you go to 34, 17 on each side, and possibly 36. Because as I joked just now when you were mentioning cities, Arizona gets in there. But a playing round, a playing game at the most – not even that. And a matter of fact, I would say they have to do Blades of Steel shootout so it goes even faster. Peace but <laughs> but the, uh, the other thing I would say for that, guys, is it just would water down the regular season for me. And then the, how long is it till the inevitable a disparity between if it's like the Canes and the Islanders in their current playoff numbers, even though they're playing a playoff round right now. I'm just saying, Anthony, I'm not trying to rip the Islanders. I'm just trying to say what the numbers are. And then it's well, there's a 14 point difference. How fair is that? Oh, sh- again, it's just oh, shut up, because that's what it comes down to. It's just that's like, kind baseball- of why I go back to your original point. Like you, you play 82 games to get in for that 16 game dance, and it, you know, in our 16 team dance, 
And if you don't, if you don't get in, you don't get in. We're, we're, it kind of devalues the regular season at some point. So that's my yeah. only concern. I, I mean, I don't, I would love, and I know for the interest of time, we have to move on, but I wouldn't be opposed if they ever went back to the old, you know, one versus sixteen when it was back when it was possible when the Islanders played the Flyers in the Stanley Cup final. I mean, just. Just imagine, like, like, I don't know, like an Oilers Flames Stanley Cup final, like you know, Battle of Alberta or Rangers Islanders or, you know, any, I mean, Maple Leafs Bruins. I mean, there's so many matchups that you would get, I think, would be pretty cool to see. Um, but for the league's, the league's point of view, it might be too regional if they ever did that to, for the whole, you know, country to care. But um, I wouldn't be opposed to that either if they ever decided to do that. I got to say that I'm against that 100% because what happens in the current format, if it was, um, well, actually, in the current format, I believe, I believe Washington is the 16th seed right now anyway. But let's say it's New York Rangers versus the Los Angeles Kings. Now the Rangers got to go cross country every single game. Yeah. Or worse yet, what about the Vancouver Canucks going to the Florida Panthers? This is interesting. Yeah. See, I do think I that's a better one. Not only that, but you – you save on logistics that way by reducing travel too, which is something that could appeal to the NHL's upper brass. <laughs> Anything to make the NHL cheaper would always appeal to their upper brass. Uh, <laughs> but guys, we are going to move on from there because we have a jam packed show for you because as we mentioned, the Washington Capitals clinched the wild card last night. That puts them into a series against the New York Rangers, first time since 2015. Phil, you remember how that ended, right? Step on in overtime. There you go. And so now you have uh, these two teams meeting for the first time since 2015. Phil, give us the overview of this series. Age before beauty, speed versus physicality. North, South versus East, West. Defense first against run and gun offense. I mean, there are a lot of a lot of polar opposites with these two teams. Um, the Capitals are a bigger, more physical, but older and slower team, and the Rangers are a younger, more talented, faster, more run and gun team that's added a physical element to it. But uh, it's it's a matter of can the Rangers get ahead and get that first goal because that's going to be one of the most important factors in this series because the, the Capitals, they're a much better team and a drastically better team when they're playing ahead as opposed to from behind. Um, Washington, they, they've kind of stuck with a style and despite the fact that they're a negative 37 in goals differential, which is just absurd – this is the first time since 1991, I believe, that a, a team has entered with a negative goal differential that high. Um, but the Capitals don't have a ton of depth. They're going to have to play, as the hockey guy describes it, low event hockey. And they're going to play a lot of close games. They want to trap. They want to get that first goal. And then they want to grind down the Rangers. The Rangers have to have to avoid slow starts in this series. And that's a thing that's bugabooed them for the last five years over three coaches. And I I can't mention how I can't count how many times I've mentioned that since we have started this channel up. Slow <laughs> starts and how that's been a problem. So for them to get the first goal in these games is paramount because not only does it put Washington in a position that they're not comfortable playing it. But Spencer Carberry is a rookie coach, and he's stuck with one style of game throughout this entire year despite having that negative goal differential and it got him to the playoffs. That's going to take a rookie coach and force him to make an adjustment mid-series and take him out of his comfort zone. We're really going to see what he's made of then. So uh, right now, I, I, I have to think that the Rangers are the overwhelming favorite. I, I want to say this is five. But I, I can see Charlie Lindgren playing as well as he has against the Rangers this year in the limited sample size, um, trying to force this to six. I don't think it's going seven at all. The one thing I will say is that the Rangers have not played the Capitals since January 14th of 2024. In that time, 
things have drastically, and I mean drastically, changed. Their record since then is 28, 10, and 2. That means that they've won 16 more games total than they've lost. The Capitals in that time frame, their record is 20, 16, and 5, meaning that they've actually lost one more game than they've won. So this is a completely different Ranger team from when the Capitals played them. And the Capitals have subtracted some pieces. Now, is Nick Jensen playing in this series? Because he took an awful spill the other night. I, I, I didn't recall seeing him in that game against Philly. Because if he's he got out, taken off on a stretcher. He got taken off a stretcher, yeah. Because uh, yeah. I, I don't think he's going to be playing in this series. That's an even know. bigger blow to them because he's actually one of their better defensive defensemen, if not their best defensive defenseman at this point. Well, do so. you know who they had playing last night in Philadelphia, Philk? And he Was got that? an assist. Dylan McElrath. Yeah, I, I saw. I don't think he's going to be much of a factor. Maybe Matt Rempe fights him, but that's really about it. But well, the Capitals are at a complete disadvantage, and the Rangers beat them in every statistic and metric and so on. The only thing you got to worry about is maybe Lindgren having a 1990 Bill Ranford run. And then at that point, the Rangers are going to have to stop playing east-west, stop trying to pass the puck into the net, and get in front of Lindgren, block his vision, and make his life hell. Well, Ryan Lindgren, Rangers defenseman, should just tell him he's not invited to Thanksgiving then. Anthony, <laughs> let's go to you first. What is your X factor in this series? It's, it's it's got to be Charlie Lindgren. If the Capitals want any any fighting chance to make this close, um, he's going to have to stand on his head and and I'll put on like a John. I know uh, Phil just used the Ranford, um, you know, comparison, but I, he's going to have to be like Jaguar from the Ducks when he won the Conn Smythe in a losing effort where he was just lights out. Um, that's what he's going to have to do for the Capitals because the Rangers just outclass the Caps in every facet of the game. So, um, so I, I don't like it. I see this series going five games, but uh, yeah, Charlie Lindgren is going to have to be really good for the Capitals to have any sort of chance. So um, on the Capitals side, Charlie Lindgren has got to be the X factor for sure. Uh, well, then I got to say, I got to just echo what Phil said, because I think he said it all right there. We're going to get to underrate our players a lot faster, but they got to play low event hockey. Because they're a minus 32 on five on five. And the Rangers, despite their struggles at five on five, they're a plus three. So that favors the Rangers. If they take out, if they go to the penalty box, that favors the Rangers. If the Rangers are taking penalties, that favors the Rangers because the Capitals power play, you know, it's, it's not what it was. And the Rangers penalty killing is among the top five in the league. So you I just, was trying to you just say the Rangers taking penalties favors the Rangers. I mean, I don't care if their penalty kill is really good, but if you put the other team on the power play mark, that's not that's not a plus. Oh well, we're gonna get it. Well, let me rephrase how I said that. <laughs> it, it's been a while. Hold on, hold on, everybody. We got it right here. <laughs> you literally just said the Rangers. All right, all, all, all right, we got it right here. The uh, the mark messed up. Uh, thing is common. So there we go. Oops, Mark messed up. So anyway, guys, no, but I mean, Anthony, it's but the but the Rangers penalty kill still is higher than where the Capitals no, power play. Is. I, I and I understand it. Dallas did on Vetchkin, but Nick Baxter ain't walking through that door, guys. So uh, I, they could, uh, they'd have to cash in. Low event hockey is the only way to do it because I mean, and and Phil. You, you don't see Tom Wilson being the usual nem uh, uh, bump that <laughs> nemesis that he's been for the Rangers. Uh, oh, man. I, uh, Tom Wilson could be a factor in that series. I think he'll have to be a factor for Washington. I think he, he, you're going to see him just try to be a menace and try to get into the Rangers' heads because that's one of the only chances that they really have of winning is that if he just becomes a complete factor in the Rangers kind of do what the Atlanta Thrashers did in 2007 and just focus on Sean Avery and let Sean Avery get under Ilya Kovalchuk's and everybody else's skin. Mm. You know, if they, if it, Wilson can do that, then maybe he could, you know, have this uh, series go a little longer, but for the Rangers, funny enough, I can't believe I, I have to say this. 
But with as down of a year that he had in his worst year, probably in about five years, it's got to be Mika's advantage yet for me as an X factor for the Rangers. Uh, if he gets going, Washington doesn't stand a chance because if that line starts producing, you know the Panarin line is going to produce. Whether it's even strength, you know, power plays, those guys are going to produce. So if those two lines get going, who who on Washington is stopping them? Carlson's not a defensive wizard. Jensen probably out for the series. He left on a stretcher. So uh, uh, against um, what game was that where he got boarded? Boston. Bo- uh, yeah, I, I think was it Boston? It, it might have been Boston. Uh, I, I don't remember what game it was, but I know he left that game on a stretcher. Um, but I'll tell you right now, um, if that if that Mika's advantage at Chris Kreider and then whoever plays with them line gets going, it, Washington stands zero chance against the Rangers because that those, those two lines are going to run amok. On oh, it was Toronto, yeah, it was it was Toronto, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. But um, yeah, so I I'll, I'll say that. But another X factor. And I, well, I we got we got to hurry because we got another uh, series to do at this. I, I'm going to say one more quick thing. If he plays, Filipino could be an X factor because depending on where he's put, whether he's a top line right wing, or whether he's third line center to add offense to that third line, that could be a big problem for Washington if he comes in and he's productive. Glad you mentioned that, Phil, because we're going to be talking more about Kittle in the Bar Talk segment. Anthony, who is an under the radar player that you're looking at in this series? Um, I'm gonna go with. I mean, I could go Connor McMichael um, for for Washington. Um, they're gonna need him to be good. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with a guy like Alexei Protus. I mean, Protus came onto the scene for Washington. He, you know, he's a big body. He helped their depth at center ice. Um, they're gonna need. They're going to need their centers to step up. Him and McMichael are going to have to, you know, drive the play and, and really make it hard on the Rangers forwards and also chip in offensively. So if you're looking at the Capitals, I mean, guys like Ovechkin, Lindgren, you know, Carlson, Wilson, yeah, those guys. But those are the guys that you expect they're going to come to play. Um, I think a guy like the, the Protuses of the world and McMichael, if they, if they can, you know, be effective players, play solid two-way hockey and, you know, chip in offensively, that would be big for Washington. Um, you know, for the Rangers, under the radar player, um, I'm going to go with Capo Caco. I mean, we all know his, his struggles this year. Uh, but, you know, if he could if he could really play his solid two way game like he usually does, but then also, you know, show the flashes that he has shown from time to time with his offensive skill, that would make the Rangers that much more dangerous. So those are the two players from each side that I would pick. Yeah, actually, you took one of mine. It was Connor McMichael. If you read uh, my article and it's amazing that you say that about a guy that's centering Ovechkin and Oshi, but they're going to need him to produce. And my guy is the guy that's got the most hits out of anybody in this series. Will Cooley. The Rangers are going to need to be physical, especially with the Washington Capitals and show them what to do. Will Cooley has got to do it. And Will Cooley has done a great job this season on that third line with Kako. I know their numbers aren't showing that. But they've done a really good job. And by the way, thank you very much. Shout out to Sonny Milano. Uh, some of his friends were over at Boss Parker's on Monday night to watch the game. Filk, who's another radar guy for you? For you, I was going to say, funny enough, um, I, I was going to go Protus for Washington. Um, that's someone who I think that is going to be relied upon to do a lot of the physical play and hefty uh, or heavy living there or heavy lifting there, rather, I'm getting my words crossed up. Um, but uh, for the Rangers, I, I, Cooley's a good one. Cooley's a real good one. Um, I, I want to say Alex Wenberg, funny enough, in this series, I, I think he's going to be relied upon to to actually do a lot of the big shutdown work here. And they're going to need him to, to chip in a goal or two or – or drive some play and get some assists and get some offense going in the bottom six. Uh, you could talk about Lafreniere, and I, I think Lafreniere is going to have a good series. I, I think this is really where you're going to start to see him break out, and I think he's going to be a, a big factor. I, I really do think it, because Panarin in years past has not had those players that have really been able to come in and help out on his line when a game gets tough and more physical. And Panarin, 
we obviously could see the change in his play, you know, getting away from those dumb drop blind passes to the middle of the ice like he did, you know, two years ago in playoffs last year and so on. Now he's attacking the middle of the ice. He doesn't have to do all of that on his own anymore now with Trocek and Lafreniere. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I definitely think that Wenberg, I would have taken Cooley if you hadn't picked him, but Wenberg is going to be somebody who's going to be somebody who's going to have to contribute a little more offensively, and he's going to be heavily relied upon defensively on the PK. So if they could stay off the PK, that'd be great, but he's going to be a guy that's going to log a lot of minutes on there because Mika's advantage and may need to play less penalty kill minutes so he can play more even strength and power play time. Well, I kind of realized that as we're mentioning that, Phil, that Anthony took the right wing on that line. I took the left wing, and you went right down the middle with Wenberg. Uh, all right, guys, it's prediction time. I'll start because why not? And in, in my article, you can find it on X and uh, just read up on that. I detailed a lot of things. Guys, I really looked for any stat besides Charlie Linger and got hot. And said that's going to say that the Capitals are going to do more in this series. But I got the Rangers in five. Anthony, what do you think? Um, I also have the Rangers in five. Um, I mean, again, if, if Lindgren, you know, performs outstanding and, you know, Ovechkin can turn back the clock a little bit, they get some more balanced scoring, which they failed to get all year, then maybe they can make it a series. But um, I'm going to say Rangers in five. If if the Rangers somehow find a way to lose a series, head, heads would have to roll. But I'm 100% confident the Rangers take care of this in fairly short order. I think if they lost this series, they're going to be like Lee Trevino in Happy Gilmore doing. <laughs> Phil, what do you think? Rangers in five as well. Um, I, I, I think, I honestly think the Rangers will probably take both of the first two games. I think Washington steals one at home. And then I think the Rangers close it out in five at the Garden. All right. Well, let's go over to the other New York team that's taking on a very tough team. Carolina Hurricanes, the number two team in the Metropolitan Division and the New York Islanders. Anthony, we know this is the setup. We know both teams have one more game to play. But give us the overview of this series. Um, a rematch from last year, right? Uh, you know, this is what kind of Gary Bettman wanted when he had this format to establish rivalries. And for the second year in a row, these two teams are playing each other as the two, three matchup. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, the Islanders, I'm sure certainly remember what happened last year and how that ended up. Um, you know, they, they pushed Carolina a little bit. I mean, they were one, they are one goal away in, in game six from having this be a seven game series. Uh, we all know that Stastny scored on a goal that, you know, if they replay that play, you know, Sorokin's going to stop it for, you know, 10 more times in a row. So uh, it was just, but that's hockey, you know, unfortunate bounce and the Hurricanes advanced. But, um, you know, I, I thought last year, I thought the Islanders played them harder than I expected. And, you know, this year, the teams are somewhat similar with some new faces on each side. But uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how the Islanders play this team under Patrick Waugh as opposed to how they did under Lane Lambert. Um, you know, the Islanders play a different style now. And, you know, I, I think, you know, for the Islanders, similar to where if they would have played the Rangers, all the pressure's on the Carolina Hurricanes right now. I mean, they, they came close to winning the President's Trophy. Um, you know, it, it's on them. The Islanders are a team that, you know, not many people picked to make the playoffs. I think there, there were that did, some that did, but they are also some that said that maybe they'd miss out. But so here they are, you know, hopefully playing free with, no pressure on them. And, you know, Patrick Waugh has them motivated. And again, you know, the Hurricanes are hot right now. Yes. But you remember the Islanders are 7 0 1 in their last eight going into tonight's finale against Pittsburgh. So they're, they're coming in feeling good about themselves. And, you know, I think, you know, it's important. If you remember last year, they dropped both games in Carolina. Um, and that's, that's not going to be a recipe that's going to equate to them winning the series or, or changing the script from last year. So I think it's going to be really important for the Islanders to try to take one of these games and rally and go back to UBS, uh, steal the home ice and have it be 1-1 because last year they were behind the eight ball from the beginning. Um, but I'm here for it. I'm ready to go. It's playoff hockey. It's the best time of year, and uh, I can't wait for it to get started. 
Phil, what's one of your X factors that you're looking into the series? You want me to pick one for both teams or? I'll just go ahead. For Carolina, I would have to say you're probably looking at someone like Jordan Stahl. And I mean, if he he's heavily relied on to be the checking guy, the shutdown guy, uh, I mean, the Islanders have a little more offense this time around with an improved improved versions of Bars Allen Horvat. Um, I know regular season numbers don't really matter at the end of the day when it comes to the playoffs, but I mean, those guys are playing better this year than they were last year. So I think there's going to be a little more respect, uh, defensive responsibility on Jordan Stahl. I think he'll also have to chip in a bit offensively too. So his workload, uh, I think, is going to be uh, tested, if you will. The real X factor to me on the Islanders is going to be Kyle Palmieri. And that's going to be whether or not he can give them that that support goal scoring, that supplemental offense to kind of boost them up and, and, and get them some goals is going to be big because if he can't, then the Islanders become a one-line team and their offense is coming from maybe two or three people at most. So they're, they're going to need secondary scoring from guys like Palmieri in order for them to win this series. Well, you took my under-the-radar player for the Islanders, so I'll mention somebody else later. But I got to tell you, this series, this really needs to stay five-on-five. Five. And the thing is, it can. The Islanders are the second-least penalized team in the league. If they keep it at five-on-five, five, or even if they get power plays, they can actually work and make an upset. Because also the other problem is Carolina, we're always, we're always going to look at their goaltending. They're going to get tested, and they're going to get tested. Probably their two best tests the last few weeks was two games against Boston. Now they're getting the Islanders, and the Islanders are motivated, and they're playing well. They're playing very well right now. Uh, they don't look like the team that lost uh, uh, six in a row last month after winning six in a row. They look like the team that won six in a row, and then, then they did it again. And Anthony's going to say what their record is uh, before. I think it's 7-0-1, Anthony. Yeah. And going into tonight, which is a meaningless game. So, Anthony, what's your X factor? Um, you know, for, for the Hurricanes, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say Jake Gensel, that the their new their new shiny toy they got the trade deadline. Um, Ooh. you know, the knock on Carolina was that they didn't have that scoring punch legitimate to help put them over the edge. Yeah, there's Aho and you know, Svechikov who's been dealing with injuries, but they needed more scoring and they got that in gate in Jake Gensel. Um, you know, if we know what Aho is going to give you, we know what is going to give you. If Gensel can can continue to be that high end player, you know that that might be a little too much for the Islanders to handle. So um, I think you know if he has a really good series, that that might be hard for the Islanders to contain. Um, for the Islanders, I was going to go with Paul Mary as my X factor, uh, but being a Phil used them, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot. Um, I'm gonna go Brock Nelson uh, last year. Jordan Stahl was out against Barzell as much as Brenda Moore can get that, that matchup. Um, and, you know, that's – so with Barzell always being shadowed, you know, that that hurts the Islanders' offense. And, you know, so if Brock Nelson can really play like the, the way we all know he can um, and produce, that would be maybe a little bit of a problem for Carolina because now they have yet – another center that's going to drive play and score goals and they can't put all their eggs in one basket with, you know, having Slavin out there against uh, Barzell stall. Um, and that would be a little harder for the hurricanes to contend with. So Nelson has, has always been pretty good in the playoffs for the Islanders. He was great in their conference final runs. You know, last year he had five points in the six games against Carolina. Um, you know, if he could do even a little better this year, I think that would go a long way with helping the Islanders. It's amazing, by the way. You guys have heard people say, possibly in the past, oh, Gensel wouldn't be anything without Crosby. Gensel without Crosby got 25 points in under a month. Wow. That's yeah, how good that's, he's been. That's good. That's really good. All right, Philk, under the radar, who do you got? I can't believe I'm saying this, honestly, but looking at his playoff history, I have to put him here because of his struggles. Marty Natchez for Carolina. Oh, like, yeah. He has not been good in the playoffs. Um, he's got 21 career points in 48 career games in the playoffs. 
including seven last year in 15 games of four goals. The year before, in 2022, five assists, zero goals in 14 games. Like that's that's just not it, it's not good enough for for him. It's not good enough for Carolina. If he continues to struggle in the playoffs, you got to wonder if they maybe look at moving him because he, he I think he kind of is what he is and he is a good player, but if this is somebody that's going to disappear come playoff time, you may need to move him for something. So if he doesn't show up in this series, uh, there's going to be a lot of questions raised about his game and his future in Carolina. I mean, for the Islanders, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to probably have to say Pajot. I, I, I think that they're going to need him to channel a little bit of what he was doing against the Rangers in 2017 and, and start to become that player to really kind of get over the hump against Carolina. You know, to, I, I keep hearing, you know, talking about slaying dragons and slaying demons. I mean, Carolina is the Islanders demon. If you think about it now, over, over definitely their dragon. It, it's, it's their dragon that they have to deal with 2019 last year, this year. I mean, Washington needed to slay Pittsburgh in order to, to get over the hump and win the cup. I mean, the Isle, it would go a long way for the Islanders if, if they, if they beat Carolina. Anthony, I'm going to go right back to you. Who would be your under the radar guys? For Carolina, it's Stefan Dosen. Um, you know, he's got yeah. that 14, he has a 14 goals uh, for them during the year. Uh, he hurt the Islanders a little bit last playoff series on the power plays in front of the net, similar Crowder deflecting pucks um, always just seems to hurt them. So, you know, and he's another guy that provides secondary scoring behind the guys like Caravine and Ajo, Svechnikov, Gensel. So, um, you know, if he could be a factor uh, in the series, that would help Carolina. Um, for the Islanders, Pajot is certainly a good one. Um, I'm going to go with the captain. I'm going to go with Anders Lee. Um, you know, 20 goals this year, which, you know, isn't isn't bad on the surface. You guys score 20 goals, so that's solid. But, um, you know, he's the captain. You want more out of him. Uh, I think, you know, he's a guy that this is his type of hockey, you know, playoff hockey. He's a big, strong guy. Mucks it in the corners in front of the net. He's got to really make it hell for, you know, Kachekov or Anderson, whoever's in goal. Um, you know, be hard on the defense in front of that Burns. He's got size. So, you know, he's got to go out these guys and, and be a physical presence and, you know, and chip in. Um, you know, if he could if he could score, especially on the power play when they get opportunities, uh, that would help the Islanders a long way. And, you know, again, he's their captain and he's, he's the guy that gets them going. And uh, I think he needs to have a, a solid series here for the Islanders. You guys already took one of mine that I used in the article, which was Kyle Palmieri. So I'm going to go in a complete different direction and say Simon Holmstrom. And he could change things around with a shorthanded goal. He's got five of them this year, and he was looking excellent with Pajot. Both of them have picked up their play as of late. I would not be surprised if those two have a pretty good series, especially the way Pajot has been playing. For the Carolina Hurricanes, I'm going to go with a guy that none of us had mentioned and he scored 30 goals, Seth Jarvis. I mean, Seth Jarvis, how is he flying under the radar in this? But he is. You can go through a lot of different things, and then people aren't even going to mention Seth Jarvis because you're so focused on Jake Gensel uh, and Aho and all the other players that were in there and Natchez, who was the leading scorer last year. Look out for Jarvis. He's He's been playing excellent hockey right now. So... Anthony, I'm going to go right back to you. Actually, you know what, Anthony? Let's have you go last because your your opinion on this matters a lot more. Philk, what do you have for the prediction? I, I yeah, don't me too. feel like I'm bashing the Islanders, but I, I just – I don't see it. It just they've and then they, they the Carolina just got Gensel as well. I gotta go Carolina at five. Wow. Uh, and I, I I think the way that the Islanders can make this a series is if Sorokin regains his form. That's another thing. Is Varlamov gonna start or is Sorokin gonna start? Because Sorokin hasn't been great down the stretch. Varlamov's really been the guy. But uh, I mean, uh, unless Sorokin finds his game and just goes to total god mode, 
I, I just don't see the Islanders having it. it. Just they lack the they lack the secondary scoring for me. The defense isn't as good as it was years ago. Um, I just for me, I, I think the Islanders are really behind the eight ball here, and Carolina is so deep, and especially after the addition of Jake Gensel, I, I think they finally have the scoring that they've needed for quite some time. I am actually. Going to go a little bit lighter on the Islanders on this one. I am going to go Carolina in seven. I love the way the Islanders have been playing down the last month and a half. They've won uh, uh, 12 out of uh, basically 18 games. Now, granted, it's not against the Carolina Hurricanes because one of those losses was against the Carolina Hurricanes. But you got to love the way that they've been playing. It's funny, Phil, you mentioned who's going to be in net because we're going to be talking more about who the Islanders have in net in Bartok. But I I think the Islanders have a guy who's going to coach them a little bit stronger and motivate them more. But Carolina is a juggernaut this year. And I think that's what's going to end up prevailing. Carolina has been in situations like this before, like against the Boston Bruins a few years ago. And I think home, home ice is going to hold serve in this series. That's what it's going to come down to. Anthony, what do you got? So I'm I'm gonna go with the Hurricanes in in six. Um, you know, I, I I just think they're they're, I mean, they're a better team. I mean, there's 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 no denying that. Um, you know, with with that said though, uh, the Islanders are not gonna make Carolina come out of this series not hurting. The Islanders are gonna hammer them. They're gonna play physical. Please um, do. You know, as Phil mentioned, they beat the, they beat them in 2019. They beat them last year, and now they're playing them again. Um, I I think there's there's starting to be the you know kind of not really bad blood, but you know they know this team has beat them twice already, and they're going to come out hard. And if they lose, they're they're like I said, they're not going to make it easy for the Hurricanes, and the Hurricanes are going to come out limping into round two because the Islanders are going to give them a run for their money. Um, you know, as Phil alluded to earlier. Barzell was hurt last year. He came back for game one. He wasn't at 100%. Horvat had just been acquired. He settled in now. So they're better. They're playing better. Uh, So I think they're going to give the Hurricanes a fight, but still the Hurricanes in six. Anthony, let me just ask one more question before we go to uh, the DraftKings uh, break and then uh, go into Bar Talk. What do you think about that Alexander Romanov can lay out a big hit and change around this series. I mean, yeah, stuff stuff like that certainly can affect the series, um, and that's what I'm alluding to. I mean, the Islanders, the Islanders are going to be physical. You know, they're they're going to come out and they're going to hit them hard. Romanov's going to be physical. You know, Clutterbuck and Martin certainly have lost a step. You know, this is probably their last hurrahs. I I think they're going to come out and put whatever's left in their body, and they're going to hit everything that moves. So they're going to try to be as physical as they can, um, and you know. The, the power of a belief is a strong thing. You know, yeah. if the Islanders yeah. steal a game in if the Islanders steal a game in Carolina and then they you know and they go home at UBS and it's rocking and they take another game, you know, then that, that changes everything. So but again, you know, like I said, you're right, Mark. Uh, I think physicality can shift the series around with a big hit or a big play. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's certainly a valid point. And we'll just have to see how, you know, what happens when the puck drops. I just want to add one thing real quick, very, very quick. With what Anthony is saying there, Carolina plays balls to the wall, and they're 100% foot all the way to the floor all year. And it seems like they gas out a lot, and they've gassed out in the past in, in the playoffs. Can they sustain that style of play for another series against a team that's going to want to beat the living piss out of them for as long as they can do it for? So that's one thing I would – uh, keep track of. Well, we're going to keep track of that a lot. And this is the third time, as you said, since 2019 that these two teams are going to be facing. Uh, I, I can't wait to see what it's going to look like. Everybody, we're going to go to Bar Talk and take a quick message from DraftKings. Hockey fans light the lamp this winter with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. New customers can bet just $5 pregame money line on any NHL team to win their game and get $150 in free bets if they do. If that wasn't enough excitement, 
you can turn small bets into bigger payouts with same game parlays. Combine multiple bets like which team will win, how many goals will be scored, and more for your shot and an even bigger payout. Download the DraftKings Sports app now. Use promo code THPN. Bet $5 on any NHL team to win their game and get $150 in free bets if they do. Only at the DraftKings Sportsbook with code THPN. Shot. This is the easiest side to answer. Let me say beer. I can't even begin to describe. I'm actually going to go crazy. I'm going to buy everybody around on this one. And welcome back to Big Apple Hockey's Bar Talk, where we're gauging our confidence on NHL topics based on our choice to drink. I'm not even going to look down at the layup talk comment. That's right there waiting for me. But welcome back to Bar Talk, where we're gauging our confidence on NHL topics based on our choice to drink. Is our confidence that you're buying everybody around? So, so, I'll just have a beer or, yeah, God, I need a shot just like this one that I had pregame. Guys, play along in the comments down below. So... What the hell happened right here? All right. There was a misspelling. I, but fortunately I caught it, but I'm admitting to it. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I was set up on this one. Guys, big news that happened this week at Ranger Camp. Philip Heedle was fully practicing with the team. I don't know if they ever said concussion. We know it's a concussion, guys. That's what the problem was. Mr. Filkowski, if he is healthy, Philip Heedle should play at third line center. I'm going to go beer. There's arguments to both sides of this. The argument for one side of it is that you put in a top line, right wing, and he ends up being, you know, the guy that helps get Zibanejad and Kreider going. That's something you can experiment with. I think he'll probably come back there and on the third line if that ends up being the case because that allows them to move Alex Wenberg to fourth line center, which moves Barkley Goodrow onto the wing where he's better suited, especially for the playoffs. So if Filipino comes back, that's a huge offensive addition for them. I I think I'm starting to lean a little more towards that he should play third line center because I think his offense could get Capo Caco's offense going, which is kind of just an it's addition by it, I guess addition if you want to call it that. But it's like a trade deadline acquisition almost. And I think that if that ends up happening, that third line is pretty damn good offensively. You have almost you have almost kid line version 2.0. Mm-hmm. You just have Cooley instead of Lafreniere here at that point. So I think that really helps them. It gives them a, a, an additional depth scoring line, and that can push them over the top against a bunch of teams. So uh, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to stick with beer for now, but I, I, I do think he ends up there. But I think there is a possibility that they experiment with him on top line first wing if Jack if Jack Roslevic doesn't end up doing anything and just looks like a nothing burger out there still. Anthony, what do you think? I'm going to go beer as well. Um, I think it's important to remember he hasn't played in a long time, and for anybody who knows the game well and, and plays hockey, um, when you're a center, you need to be the first one back. Um, and you need you need to really bust your ass. And for a guy who hasn't played, maybe his conditioning isn't you know where it would normally be. Um, I think easing him back into the lineup, playing the wing, could be uh, easier on him. It's less defensive responsibilities uh, and overall less skating. So I think that might t- to that might be the better decision. Just until he starts to get his conditioning back and get the feel and the game and get up to game speed. But um, I mean, certainly. If the Rangers decide to put him at center, they're going to be confident that he could, you know, play at play that position sufficiently for the playoffs when there's everything's just magnified. I got to go beer two guys and make it a hat trick. I'll throw up the hat trick graphic in a second. But the other thing about it is, guys, it's I mean, I'm torn. I think he could go first line. I like the way Wenberg has played, even though the numbers hasn't exactly shown it. That being said, uh, Roslovic has actually put up some good, uh, decent stats, even though he's been a healthy scratch. It's been up and down. But, Phil, you just made a great point, too. You move Heedle back to his third-line center spot. You move uh, down Wenberg. 
Barkley Goudreau moves over, maybe you move Jimmy VZ up to the top line if somebody falters. Rangers, Rangers can kind of have a lot of depth if Filipino is healthy. That's a big thing. One place where the New York Islanders have depth is goaltending. You look at Simeon Varlamov in the last 10 games, uh, 8, 1-1, one one, 930 save percentage, 207 goals against. Ilya Sorokin starting to get his mojo back. Last three games, 2-0-1, 944 save percentage. That's what Anthony would like to see. And a 160 goals against as well. But Anthony, the Islanders should play Varlamov game one of the playoffs. So, I mean, I think you guys all know, you know, Ilya Sorokin is one of my favorites. Um, you know, I think... Despite the year he had this year, he's still one of the elite goalies in the league. It just, you know, it just happens. I mean, even Igor wasn't Igor this year for a large majority of the year when you look at his numbers. Um, with that said, there's no denying that Varlamov has been has been kind of carrying the load here. So I think he, I think at the very least, he deserves to um, to start game one and then go from there and see what happens. Uh, but like you just said, Mark, you flashed Sorokin's uh, stats there the last the last three games. Um, it's not like you know he's been he's been trash, and it, it's the decision should be you know really really easy to make. I mean, the last three games he started to play really well, so uh, he certainly you know, deserves to be strongly considered to start game one. But I think just just because Varlamov has been the guy lately, and Juan knows him from Colorado, uh, I think he has the first leg up to start. But if things go awry and, you know, he loses badly in game one, let's just say, I think he'll be quick to go back to Sorokin. Phil, what do you think? I'm close to saying round, but I'm going to go beer. And the reason why I would have said round is you could have pulled a, a group hour pulpy from 2018 with this. And if one goaltender, you know, started faltering, if Bar Lama falters, you can go back to Sorokin and, you know, it, you could do it after game one. I mean, doing it after game two might be risky against a team like Carolina. Washington was a better team than Columbus. And that's why they were able to go two games with Grubauer and then realize that Grubauer wasn't the answer and then go back to Holpe. So I, I do think that if they, if they're down after game one and Barlamov does not play well, they'll go right back to Sorokin. And that could also be like a, like a goaltending change mid-game, where if you do it early enough and you're losing and you're still close, but your team's playing like crap, it kind of sparks the team and and, and re-energizes them and, and can help them come back and win a game. That can help them come back and win a series, I think. So, uh, I mean, I, I would absolutely go with Marlamov game one, but I could see the argument as to why you would go with Sorokin. So that's why I'm only going to say beer. So Mark, I'm before you go, wanting, uh, oh, yeah. Before you go, I'm just gonna say I gotta, I gotta go get L. I gotta hop off. Um, however, just want to add quickly before I go, uh, Islanders recalled Ruslan Ishikov. As you guys know, he's making his NHL debut tonight. If anyone wants to tune in, I'm, I'm excited to watch him play. The guy's a skating highlight reel, so it'll be interesting to see if he actually can play the game at this level. So, uh, interested to watch him play tonight, but. Um, Take the, take the rest of the way, boys, and uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Talk to you later, Ant. Later, Ant. And let's just fix that. And, uh, Philk, I am actually going to go beer as well, and I think one of the reasons why is because of the relationship between Var, uh, Varlamov and uh, Sorokin. Sorokin does respect them a lot. Anthony brought up a, a, a you brought up the Grubauer one. Anthony brought up another one too. Uh, I'm going to actually bring up 1995. Mike Richter and Glenn Healy. Mike Richter, not himself in the in the regular season, started the playoffs against the uh, Quebec Nordiques. He he lost game one five four. Uh, Bob Basson, I believe, had a tip in with like a minute remaining, but still he did not look good in that game. Healy then comes on. They win games two and three. And he starts game four and is a little bit shaky. They go back to Richter. Richter never gives the job back uh, pretty much for the rest of his career unless it was due to injury. That being said, I don't like doing that. I like I like going with your number one if you have to, uh, which is interesting for some teams because you don't know who their number one is. So we'll see about whether or not it's the right move. 
I think you can start game one with, with Varlamov and uh, that I let my regionalism not take over my mouth right there because I, I didn't say Varlamov, but uh, but Varlamov. And uh, I, I think they can possibly do that. I, I just I you just hope that move doesn't backfire on the Islanders. Phil, let's go to the two teams that were eliminated just last night. The Philadelphia Flyers and the Pittsburgh Penguins were both eliminated when the Capitals won. Phil, the Flyers will make it back to the playoffs before the Pittsburgh Penguins. Beer. I, I could see Pittsburgh being stupid and trying to double down on what they've been doing. And and Dubas, I don't know. I, I don't think Dubas is really brought in to rebuild. I said to a friend of mine who's a Pittsburgh Penguins fan that the worst thing that happened to the Pittsburgh Penguins, and it's probably best for everybody else in the division, but the worst thing that happened to the Penguins was Jim Rutherford leaving for Vancouver because mm -hmm. Patrick Alvin was the next guy to be Pittsburgh's GM once Rutherford stepped into upper management. And Alvin has done a hell of a job with the Canucks. So thank God that happened. And um, I, I could just see Pittsburgh being dumb and, and going uh, and doubling down on this. But I could also see Pittsburgh finally dealing Crosby and dealing him to Colorado. And because he's he's good buddies with Dean McKinnon. I'm pretty sure they were in each other's wedding parties. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could see that happening too. So uh, I will – I'm going to say beer. I, I don't know if I trust the fly, the Flyers at this point. And I don't know if Tortorella is going to be there next year. I really don't. With what happened down the stretch with them and the way they fell apart and, and then the, the stuff with Couturier, I, I don't know how they mend that. I really don't. So uh, I'm going to go beer. It's truly amazing. And, I mean, I'm going to go beer as well. You're talking about two teams. They're going the same direction. They're going backwards. And the um, the other thing I would say for you about that is I kind of look at it and just think the Penguins, they, not that they need to strip it down, like they got lightning in a bottle with Michael Bunting compared to uh, they were supposed to be thrown away their season. Bunting did pretty well for them. But is is that but again, Phil, is that the type of player that's going to play with City Crosby and everything's going to be hunky dory? I don't know. I don't know what their situation is in net because can are, are they going to move on from Tristan Jari? I don't know how. He's got a, a pretty big deal for them to move on from. You got Eric Carlson, who's an actual albatross. Look, there's a lot of things that Pittsburgh's going to have to answer. And the Flyers don't have as many answers because they realized they had to rebuild long ago. So we're going to we'll, we'll see about it. It's it's still it's, it's almost a dead heat because I don't know what's going to happen. I'll say this. Matvey Mitchkov comes over sooner than later. That could change things around. So we we know that there's potentially a star in the in the wings for the Flyers. Phil, two coaches were announced today and or today and yesterday at two different fates. The Montreal Canadiens are going to bring back Marty St. Louis, is going to stay for the next three years. And the Buffalo Sabres fired Don Granado. They're now looking for their eighth head coach in the last 12 years seasons i did have the word and in here but the canadians and the sabers made the right decisions with their head coaches round um i i, I don't necessarily think it's a layup but round um i was watching the game last night on the tsn feed on montreal for a little bit um i'll say this for slavkovsky caulfield um, it was another young one that I'm thinking of. Oh, Suzuki and Matheson to all hit career numbers for them. Uh, that's that that's pretty impressive for Marty San Luis, considering the injuries they had trading Sean Monahan, you know, well before the deadline, who was actually producing for them. Uh, you know, they they got they, they got mileage out of the roster that they have. Um, they have some players. I mean, Lane Hudson and Logan Mayu end up making their debuts on consecutive nights, and they both end up getting their first assists 
in the games. So I, I, I do think that they they made the right choice of keeping Marty San Luis around. I was I was skeptical of that hire because he was coaching a friend of mine before that for mid Fairfield prep. <laughs> Just gotta remember that. He was coaching prep school hockey. So uh yeah, it's it, it, it's crazy to think about, but Marty San Luis has really proven himself to be a co- a pretty good head coach. Don Granado, um it's not all on him. It's not, but I, I think that they just lost steam. And the reason I say that is because you have so many players regress this season. And I get it. A lot of guys posted career numbers last year for Buffalo. Thompson, Darlene, Middlestat. I mean, you go up and down their lineup. The only guy that really got better in their lineup was J.J. Paterka. That was, that was really it. So um, I, I wonder what's next for Buffalo, but I, I, I think there was a new voice needed. I think things needed to change. I also think a big part of it is on Kevin Adams. Kevin Adams really did nothing to improve that team in the offseason. He was like, oh, they got so far. They got they, they got so close. I don't have to do anything. My job is pretty much set. I'm going to go, you know, just sign Eric Johnson and hope that they make the playoffs. No, you, you got to go out. You got to add players. I, I, I Listen, I, I'm actually in agreement with this, MP. I, Adams is more culpable and more, more to blame than Granado is here. I, I, I do agree with this 110%. Uh, but at the end of the day, the coach is usually the guy that takes the fall. And Granado took the fall. And now the next coach that comes in is probably going to be Adam's last shot. So this coach has to get it done. Do they go with somebody like Gallant? Do they bring back Lindy Ruff and have a reunion with him? I don't know which way they go, but I'd imagine it's probably not a young, fresh-faced coach. It's not somebody that's going to be a first-timer. They're going to go for a coach with experience because the GM's life is probably on the line. And I'm going to say who that coach is. But first, I am going to go just down to a beer because I, I still think, look, I understand the GM's life might be on the line, which it is, I think, by now. But Don Granado, he did a good job last year. This year, there was a lot of injuries. So I'm not sure if that's on him, as you were saying. But – Phil, this is the way you you destroy an organization. There's no stability. If I'm an NHL coach, am I looking at that job and going, oh, I can't wait to go coach in Buffalo right now? I mean, I got to go coach in Buffalo. And it's, I mean, granted, you get Tage Thompson. You get a lot of talent. There's plenty of talent that's in the pipeline. But then you have to ask yourself, how long is my leash? And Gerard Gallant it, it basically asked the same thing with the New York Rangers, which he has a point and was slightly tone deaf at the same time. But it's just that's we'll see we'll see who's going to be there. But let me throw this name out for you, Phil, because it's been banded around. Craig Berube going to the Buffalo Sabers. I mean, that's another one. I, like I said, somebody experienced. I, I, I remember last summer when I was talking about who they were going to hire, and I kept telling everybody they're not going to hire Carberry. They're not going to hire Knobloch or anybody like that. Stop asking for those types of hires. It's not going to happen. And they went and they hired La Violette. They were so going to do a terrible choice. Yeah, terrible choice so far. Only President's Trophy and 55 wins. Most most wins and points in franchise history. Not really, really bad. I wonder where those people are right now, actually. The, oh, I didn't want La Violette. Yeah, you didn't want La Violette. You really don't want him right now, do you? But I, I really do think that Buffalo is going to hire a veteran head coach. It's it's just like the Rangers when they lost in 91 or 92 to Pittsburgh. And then they came back and they had that terrible year in 93. And a lot of the players, I think even Messier himself said it, said, we deserved Keenan. They deserve somebody that's going to come in and absolutely whip their asses into shape because that – that core group, they ain't going to learn unless a veteran coach comes along and, and tells them how to do it. Okay. 
were you reading my article about that? Because that's what I, I said about the 94 Rangers. No, uh, I, I haven't. And <laughs> I, I've, I, I've said that on Twitter. I've said that on streams. So I, I haven't really read the article about that. I'm sorry. Well, uh, I did say nostalgia is a funny thing. There's a lot of similarities to the 94 team that's in this year's team. Well, Philk, let's go to uh, a couple more, uh, one more similarity for the New York Ranger fans, because uh, we've heard this line before. Jared Bednar, after Sunday's game against the Vegas, when they came back and won with three goals in the third period, we really needed a big save from Georgie there. The Winnipeg Jets and Colorado Avalanche series will hinge on goaltending. Oof, beer. Um, I, I, I only got to say that because I, I Colorado has just – they have one of the best rosters in the entire NHL on paper. They really do. They get Gabe Landeskog back. That that would be a huge, huge shot in the arm for them. Um, but I do agree that that goaltending is going to take center stage in this series because you have probably the best goaltender in the league right now who's probably going to win the Vezina. He's the Vezina favorite by far. I'd be shocked if he doesn't win it. Um, against a goaltender who's been much maligned for inconsistent play and worked his way out of New York, basically cried his way out of New York because he didn't like the fact that someone came along, stole his starting job from him, despite the fact that he was 10 times better. Um, I, I really don't think Yorgiev is all that great. I don't. I think he's an okay starter. He's a middle, I'd say middle to bottom of the barrel, star, or bottom of the league starter. But Connor Hellebuck is just a wall, and he is incredible. So that's one team I wouldn't want to face. And Winnipeg has owned them in the season series. And I know Colorado is going to come out flying after what happened the last time these two teams faced, and they got slapped around 7 nothing. But um, Georgiev has been maligned. And, yes, there was an issue with Taves. Taves did say something that could be – I forget exactly what he said, but it was a few weeks back, um, and they – I can tell you right now the team was not happy with Georgiev's performance. And, I, and Tony D'Angelo, I know that Tony D'Angelo gets, you know, his share from the Rangers fans for, you know, what happened and his exit and everything like that and his political views – not going to get into any of that, but the incident that really got him out of New York involved Georgiev, and it involved bad play. And if you remember that game with Pittsburgh, he let up some really, really bad goals, including an overtime winner, which was terrible. And that's what started that incident. Tion D'Angelo called him out for it. So um, Georgiev, uh, you know what? I, I can honestly see Colorado losing this series because of the Yorgiev. Phil, it's funny you say that and talking about nostalgia. That was our second show. And the first show, I told you, I think the Rangers are done with, with Tony D'Angelo. They're just waiting for the excuse. And then that incident happens. But this is not new. This is what Yorgiev has always been. He, he's up and down, gets off his angles. And then next thing you know, all right, uh, I can't use the word my uh, former captain Kevin Darjinsky used to use, but uh, there was this, it, it. It began with cluster and rhymed with duck, but it's yeah, uh, it's, we sort know of, what you mean. it's sort of like uh, it's just what like Georgiev he he loses focus. I also think a little bit of it is he might be gassed. He plays a lot. Like give the guy a break, but and then that's what happens. And then it, you take him out of the net, and he he ends up flipping out about it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly what happened. And yeah, Tony ended up out out because of it. But yeah, Georgiev, Georgiev's not. I don't think he's very good. I really don't. And I can honestly see Colorado losing this series because of him. And Hellebuck, Winnipeg is no joke. Winnipeg's nope. no joke. They play a very sound defensive game. And the other thing that Colorado is going to have to deal with is Winnipeg's size and physicality. Those guys are all big and can skate. 
and they will do everything they can to hammer Colorado's star players at every chance they get. So we'll we'll see how their conditioning holds up taking those types of hits. And the other thing, Philk, the wake up call to Colorado, they got thumped, absolutely thumped by Winnipeg. Like nothing, yeah. So I mean, we'll see about that. And one team that probably wants the other one to go back to sleep, the Vegas Golden Knights moved into. Uh, Nope, not first place in the Pacific. Uh, third place in the Pacific. And it's okay. I caught it. I caught it. There we go. Third place in the Pacific currently matched up against the Edmonton Oilers. Phil, this this series is going to go the distance. Well, I mean, it's not a guarantee that that's going to be the matchup. So, I, I not a guarantee yet. But if it does. If it's L.A., it's going five. I mean, I I don't know about that. I don't I don't think the Oilers are really going to do anything to the Golden Knights. I, I, I think that's going less than – I'm going to say shot. I, I mean, Vegas gets yeah, – I mean, I, th- I think they're just a better team. Hurdles back. I, I mean, they're going to get Stone back. The minute the, minute the playoffs start, Stone's going to come back. We all know it. It's been coming for a while. <laughs> Williams has been assigned to Minneapolis hockey. <laughs> Not even small apple, mini apple. I got, I'm going right down oh, the to like the league. Oh, geez. But um, yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll say that that's not happening at all. I, I don't think the Oilers have what it takes to. To, have, to go seven with the Knights. I mean, the goaltending is relatively close, and neither of their goaltenders are great, if you ask me. And Vegas is the far deeper team, and Edmonton's defense is questionable still. So I, I don't see, unless McDavid and Dreisaitl absolutely go God mode and have one of the greatest series we've ever seen, then I, I don't. I don't really know how Edmonton gets that anywhere close to seven. I, I would say Edmonton would be on five if those two teams played. Uh, I'm looking at the Golden Knights and thinking about all the additions that they made. The one that they're getting back, obviously, in Mark Stone. Bill Kitts. Turtle, Hannafin, Mantha. Like how, how, is Edmonton, how is Edmonton keeping up with that? I don't know. And it's like I want to have the belief in Edmonton this time. I want to believe that this is a better team. That they're not that they're not going to be just hey now now it's time for the playoffs. Oops, we're out already because all they do is run and gun. They have played better defense than they have last year, but it's not that much of a compliment, I guess I would say. Uh I can go beer on this though because if I look at it last year where I think Vegas wasn't as strong and it's funny you're saying that about the Stanley Cup champs. Aiden Hill came in that series, I believe, in game three. And then game four. Uh oh no, I think it was I think it was game four, maybe. But anyway, he comes in the series, middle of it, ends up winning game five, game six, becomes a story in that series. And then he they ride the wave of him to the Stanley Cup finals. And it looks like that team is actually kind of built around him. Lou, thank, thank you, you very much. We appreciate that. Yeah, because we uh we work hard on these, so we're always looking for yes, better numbers. Mark works hard on his layups, everybody. So lay off them just a little bit. Hey, I haven't had haven't had to get the gift at all today. So um, I do think I do think that this was. <laughs> At least I got the names of the goaltender right on this one, but uh, I I do think that if this there was a chance, like if McDavid and Drysaddle kind of pulled it out in Game Six, it goes to seven. But you know something, you know, I don't know. I, I just don't know. And I do agree with Chris. Look out for the Jets because they are deep. And but Rick Bonus, he's only gotten a one Stanley Cup final. Uh, wait, one? I believe only one in his career. I don't think he was there with the Bruins. So it'll be interesting to see. He was there with Dallas only just recently. So he can engineer that run. And as Romanell is saying, don't forget, Edmonton won 16 games in a row and didn't even win their division. They are very vulnerable. Yes, they are, because, again, they never take defense and goaltending seriously. 
Guys, thanks very much for watching Big Apple Hockey's Bar Talk, where we gauge our confidence on NHL topics based on a choice of drink. But, Filk, I'm a little bit sad tonight because a few months ago, uh, the last mark on the road that I was able to do, uh, that I took my lovely wife to be to a game, and it was the Arizona Coyotes. They will be playing their final game in Arizona tonight. The team will move to Salt Lake City next season. And again, as the, the NHL, they of course, they had to do it. They made the agreement, and they didn't even tell the players yet. They were starting to inform the players. Uh, as of I think it was Friday when all this was going down, Phil. Now, look, now the NHL can at least have a reasonable partnership with Salt Lake City. And maybe they can go back to Arizona eventually. But uh, it's kind of bittersweet for me. I, I I think that the drama needed to end. But Arizona also dropped the ball on this one, too. Yeah. Thought Alex Morello would be stable ownership. Made a lot of promises. Said a lot of good things. Um, not happy about the fact that. They're leaving. I know I will be purchasing an Arizona Coyotes Kachina jersey because I don't purchase many jerseys anymore, but I will be purchasing one of those um, because I love that jersey and I would hate to not be able to have it before it goes. Um, this is actually uh, Arizona was a success because it created Austin Matthews, true or false. Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's true because of Austin Matthews. I would say Arizona hockey in Arizona was a success because it, it, it helped it helped Southwest expansion. Mm -hmm. It really has. I mean, it, it just that you if you walk if you know the hockey scene out that way and the hockey scene in California and in like the Southwest in, in, in the United States. It actually has expanded quite a bit. It, it's growing. It really is. So it, it's not just because it created Austin Matthews. It's because of the fact that it's exposed a different area of the United States to hockey. And I just, I, I hate the fact that they're going. I, I really do. I, I don't like it. I, I think if, if Gary Bettman, I think if he put in half the effort that he put into saving Pittsburgh to saving teams like Hartford and Arizona and, and so on. I think a lot of those teams would still be here, but it just, it, there hasn't been the same effort and the ownership has had worse problems in Pittsburgh than they did in, in Arizona or, or Hartford. And it's just a shame that we love Pittsburgh. We're going to save Pittsburgh but we're not going to do anything to save the other franchises. I just, I think if you, you're going to do that for one, you got to go out of the way and do it for another. The only thing I'll say in that regard is that I am kind of excited to see what happens with Salt Lake city. Mm -hmm. see how that market could be. Cause if, if that can stick, maybe they can bring back the, uh, the coyotes at, at another point in time. Kind of like what they're probably going to do with the Atlanta Thrashers. I think that the Atlanta Thrashers are coming back. I think that that's going to be the new team in Atlanta. And I think they'll have better, better stable ownership in a better area, nicer area with a better arena. And I, I think that the Thrashers, this version of them, I'm, I'm, go, I'm going to call them the Thrashers because I think that's what they're going to be. I think they're going to be the Thrashers. I think it's going to be better this time around. So if, if Salt Lake City – works out a little bit and they keep a team there and they can come back to Arizona in the future with another, with the coyotes version 2.0 there. I think they will go ahead and they will be a better team. The Utah Yeti. I don't know. Maybe the Utah Sidewinders, maybe the Utah Arctic dogs. I don't know. I have no clue what that was. I, I, I always go back to the Utah Olympians, which by the way, I think it's Mount Olympus. This is that's around there too. Somebody tweeted at me today. The, um, the thing I say with that, also the reason why, obviously because Salt Lake City hosted the Olympics, but also 
we can't have any names that might ever offend somebody. I mean, who knows? Maybe if I we call them the Olympians, maybe that offends people that couldn't be in the Olympics. Uh, I don't I don't know what's up with that one. And I could already if, if you're listening on audio, you should see the 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 look on Felix Felix's face when I said that. But um I think it's also it there were just a lot of mistakes that were made with Arizona. And a lot of players embraced Arizona. Jeremy Roenick, for one. Uh, you can look at other players that were born in Arizona, like the Kachuk brothers, obviously Matthews, and uh, I think I had a couple more of them right over here. Uh, Tage Thompson was born in Arizona. Matthew Nice was born in Arizona. Um, obviously, Josh Doan, Ty Conklin. But there's a- – Arizona was able to produce – Um, some bit of hockey. A lot of players said they loved living in Arizona, just not playing for the Coyotes. And if the NHL or when the NHL, because it will happen again, when they go back to Arizona, have a plan. Don't put them in a basketball arena right away. And then don't make them arena. That's two and a half hours away from the, the main hub. Put it in near North Phoenix or somewhere where people actually live and they don't want to drive two and a half hours. The city planners screwed this up a lot. Yeah. And, and people didn't see it. They, they, they're just going, Oh, we'll just move them down there. We'll have like uh, an event place. Not nah, just. Thank you, John. Um, John, do you many, thank you. How many teams will be in the league in 10 years? I, I I'm going to go with 34. I think they're going to add two more teams. I, I, I highly doubt they get to 36. Um, Pete is saying 36. I, I think I think 34 is where it's going to be, though. I think it's going to be 36 because I think they're going to go back to Atlanta and Salt Lake, Arizona. Salt and, Lake is um, only going to be one. It, it's Salt Lake is not going to affect the number. Right, but Salt Lake, they're moving it over there. So, all right, let's go with the ones that aren't there because I didn't mention one city that I think they're going to definitely expand to. But we mentioned Arizona, they're going to go back. Atlanta, they're going back. Quebec City, I think there's a good chance they could still go back eventually. I don't think that's going to happen. Then the other one is the second team in Toronto. But I definitely think they're going to Houston eventually. I, I, I could see Houston. I, 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 can't, I can't see Kansas City, though. Even though Kansas City has an arena, Pete, I can't see Kansas City and I can't see Quebec. Maybe a second they've they've talked about a second team in Toronto for a long time. That's I don't the, know. I, I don't I don't see how it works. The, the Leafs it just too you, you have you have the Leafs and then you have Detroit there there's just too much. It's like Hartford. Uh, and, and I get the NHL wants new markets, but that that's not a new market bringing in a second team to Toronto. You want and, a good US market that nobody talks about? What about Madison or Milwaukee? Put a team in Wisconsin. That's literally what Joe Shane Train just said. Yeah, said thanks, Milwaukee. Joe. I mean, college hockey is immensely popular over there. So I don't not? see Cleveland or, or Char- Charlotte. They, I mean, you're already in North Carolina and Raleigh. I don't think Charlotte's going to really do anything. No, um, and I don't think they're going to try to get another team in Florida right now. Hartford's big issue wasn't just corporate sponsorship. It was, a, it was the arena they played it. They played in a mall practically. So it's just I, I don't see Portland. No, uh, nobody's going to Portland anymore. I don't. I um I, I I would imagine they would have to gauge what's going on with the Winter Hawks there, because the Winter Hawks have been a junior hockey franchise forever there. But mm-hmm. I don't I don't see it. Um I I mean the Houston Arrows were an a, a WHA and an AHL team for a while. So yeah, I would say Houston and Houston would definitely be a team that would definitely get it, or a city that would definitely get a team. So, all right. So let's go answer a couple more questions, and we'll go, we'll go till seven ten. Cut it off there. Yeah, because I I've got stuff I've got to do. Yeah, likewise. But uh, guys, we'll take some of your questions first. Really jam packed show we had into there. In, in yeah, we got a lot. Um, I started some questions from earlier on. Uh, Evan pointed out that you said a couple of weeks ago that they aren't dead because they're goal differential, and then you said they they would make it Pittsburgh. So that's why he's okay. I all right. Well, I said that because also you're looking at Sidney Crosby. 
I did say at the beginning of the year, Pittsburgh is on a playoff team. Okay. Um, Pete said, never mind the other third, 73 points. Detroit could have gotten this season yet. I mean, Detroit did miss out on a bunch of them. So, yeah, that is pretty interesting. Everest yeah. said, no love on uh, ESPN Ranger for the Rangers, not a legitimate cup contender. Then again, I'm not really worried about ESPN. So, yeah, if I had to worry they, about. They said Artemi Benarin would have 80 points this year, and he had 120. <laughs> Chris Kreider, what did they say for him? 37 35, points? 35, I think it was. 35, 35 37. points. The guy had 39 goals. Oh, geez, that was great. Um, J.E. wants to know who our upsets for the first round are. I don't who do you got? Matchups. Other, I mean, in the West, I, it's, I, I don't think the West is really determined yet. The, the seeding is, is not determined just yet. But let's Ooh. say if it is right now, it is what it is. Okay, for argument's sake, or for for hypothetical sake, I guess, if you will. Um, let's see. And I'll say, by the way, with that, there's no chance they can go to seven. They can't afford it. Well, I already gave my picks on Rangers and Car and Islanders. And I could see, I could see Tampa upsetting Florida. It really could. I mean, I don't know how big of an upset really would be, but technically, since it's wild card one versus uh, the second division winner, I mean, it is technically an upset, but I, I, could, I could see that. I could see Toronto finally breaking the Boston curse. I just don't trust Boston's – I don't trust their center depth. I don't. I, I really wonder who they're going to get scoring from outside of uh, Pasternak and Marsh end. At this point, I mean, there's going to have to be a lot of guys that are going to have to step up and have big series for them. Coyle, Zaka, DeBrusque. I mean, those guys are going to be asked to shoulder a, a big offensive load because everyone's going to key in on Pasternak and Marsha. Um, if there's an upset in the West. By the way, yeah, oh, no, I already said I, that. I, 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 I could, the only upset I could see in the West would be Nashville uh, over Vancouver. That that's mine. I could see happening. That, that's mine. I love the way Nashville has been playing. I got to wonder about the health of Thatcher Demko. And really, the record kind of favors, um, the, it favors Nashville since they made the Elias Lindholm trade. But, that one, Matt's got a good point too. Yeah, really it, it is a good point, but I, I I think I would trust the Leafs more than I, I would trust the the Bruins center court. You got to remember, like the there's a lot of offense that's going to be expected from players who really are not that good. It's more probable that the great players on Toronto finally break through than the guys who really aren't that good on Boston end up giving them the offense that they need to beat Toronto. The difference in that series is going to be goaltending. It's going to be goaltending because Toronto's goaltending is not great. And Boston's is better, but they haven't gotten it done in the playoffs. Swayman and, and Omar couldn't get it done in the playoffs. Again, I know it was Florida. Yes, I understand they went on a crazy run. They had their Cinderella run last year. But I, I just don't think that their goaltending is all that great. It's good. It's not great. So yeah, this is, this is actually I'm... a good point by Patrick. Keith getting outmaneuvered. I mean, Montgomery is a far better coach. Jim yep. Montgomery is an absolutely a, a, a better coach than Sheldon Keith. So that that's another key factor right there. Like that phase Keith made in Game One last year versus Tampa. That's typical. Sheldon Keefe, where he's just like, oh. So um, I'm hoping, by the way, Andy, I might be able to make a bracket, but I would have loved to have said it for everybody today, but th there was too much going on. Boxing fan 5555 five, five says, do we want Hedo to play? Only if he's medically cleared and healthy. If, if he's medically cleared, which I'd imagine he is, if he's taking – if he's doing full contact practices – I'd imagine the doctors have medically cleared him. 
So, I mean, if if the doctors say he's good, that's the only thing we can do because we can go by the doctors and nothing else. I just hope he doesn't get hurt again. But I do feel like deep down inside, I feel like he's won not even a check, but maybe even an awkward collision away from something catastrophic and everything being over. Mike Richter's career was over on a simple bump. Todd Marchand, accidental knee through the crease. Although I really wonder how accidental it was considering the angle of his knee if you watch it again. Uh, but, it's, I think it was a little bit more accidental, but he knew, he knew Mike Richter. I don't think he wanted to, to try to hurt him. Uh, we got snappers be jumping and saying, even there after Montgomery botched the goaltending situation last year in the first round, I think he should have stayed with Olmark unless Olmark was injured in that game, but he, he went to Swayman. I think he, they did him a tremendous disservice. In regards to Arizona moving, the league is giving Morello five years to get an arena built and they will bring them back as an expansion team. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty much what I thought was going to end up happening. Um, and Morello better get his shit together. You can and, play the Rick and Morty you know, clip, Mark. Uh, well, Phil, Phil, it's even worse because Morello, I think, has to give back a $1 million payment. Yeah, it's something like incredibly that. small, but yeah. Yeah, I remember that. That was a February 2002 game, and they were – they were surging after getting Bure, and they put Bure with Lindros and Rachinsky, and that line was going. Flurry was in. Uh, Flurry was no. Flurry didn't miss any games that year. He didn't go into substance abuse that year. It was the year before he went into substance abuse. But um, Flurry was on their second line with Nedved, I believe. But the top line was going, um, and that it was a Chris Tamer slap shot. Like probably about like a, I don't know, maybe about like a sixty foot slap shot that just hit him on the side of the mask, and I was wondering like, because it didn't look that bad, but then Richter took his helmet off and left the game. I was like, oh crap! I'm guessing that helmet was pretty thin. Yeah, I watched that on on camera too, and I think Richter finished the game. I think. No, I think he left that game. Yeah, I, but I remember watching that too. And uh, a friend of mine who is a real um, crapster uh, called up FAN and said, so you're telling me the Rangers have two crackheads on the team now? But uh, the the um, Mike Richter, though, pillar of class for the New York Rangers. And it's, it's just, uh, once again, proof that it's sad about you don't get to choose your how you leave. Very few uh, players ever do. And one of the great things was Glenn Sather surprising him by saying they're retiring his number uh, next uh, next year. All right, guys, we're at 7-Eleven right now. We're going to wrap it up uh, as we speak. Always great talking with you guys. We're going to be doing a lot more shows during the day, if not at night after the game. So uh, there's just a lot of coverage we have to do. This is sort of Christmas for us. And I'm actually going to be growing facial hair out again, which is going to make people realize how old I really am. <laughs> well, because <laughs> all the grays are right here. And that's where they are. For the most part. Oh, we're playing. Uh oh. Yeah. Finally got a chance to play the, the song again. We've had to, to get up. Thanks, Manny. Thanks. Because, like, like I said, we work on all this. Look for all the different. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Ranger Central live tonight at 8 p.m. They'll be doing a stream, so if you guys want to uh, go out over there and, and check them out, um, I'm going to be out, so I unfortunately will not be able to watch that, but you guys have a great show. Um, and also thanks. check out their guest appearance with Philk on the, the final buzzer, where you forgot, yes. you, you finally got to use your new intro. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Snappers be jumping is going to want off. All right, nice. Uh, head down the croakers to uh, Saturday night. Oh, yeah. All right. Pull up. Pull up. All right. That's great to see you guys. And uh, read up on my article on the Islanders Carolina series, too. That's on the X. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Dinner time, and we will talk to you soon.